Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our Watershed Advisory Committee meeting for today, October 22nd. I'd like to introduce Jeff Jowett, who will walk us through the meeting and begin today's broadcast. Jeff. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Watershed Advisory Committee meeting for the Lake Erie Direct Tributaries and Chagrin River. Uh, our spring WAC meeting uh, unfortunately was canceled due to COVID, but that presentation was posted on our website. I hope you're able to take a look at that. Um, but uh, we're here to provide you an update on the regional stormwater management program. So again, my name is Jeff Jowett. I'm a senior watershed team leader uh, for the Lake Erie Direct Tributaries and the Chagrin River area. I want to uh, briefly introduce the folks here from the Seward District. So we have uh, Ann Roberto with us, Janet Popoelski, Keith McClintock, Lila Zotner, Matt Sharver, Michael Blair, and Paul Kowalczyk. Those are our presenters today. And then also in attendance from the Seward District, let me look down the list here. Uh, Crystal Davis, David Ritter, George Remius, Jonathan Brower, Kelsey Amdon, uh, Mark Link. And I think that's it. Hope I didn't forget anybody. But uh, for today, we're going to give you uh, some general updates about the sewer district. Uh, we're going to talk to you about where we stand with the stormwater master plan. Um, we're going to get a presentation on our swim group, Stormwater Inspection and Maintenance. We have a special guest, uh, Kevin Freeze from Cuyahoga County Office of Emergency Management will be here. And uh, then we'll dive into stormwater design and construction and we'll provide you with a brief look ahead. Now let me introduce to you Matt Sharver, our Deputy Director of Watershed Programs to provide you some program highlights. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for attending uh, the meeting today. Uh, we've got a, a whole host of uh, good presentations and should be informative to you. And, and these are always important to uh, reach out to our member communities and, and partners uh, to give you a, a, at least two general updates throughout the year through these watershed advisory community meetings. But I'm just going to highlight three items today. Just want to talk briefly about the uh, budget for the district in terms of the stormwater management program. Um, as we are all facing different challenges um, this year, uh, the district, uh, in terms of our program, we did have to cut about $6 million from the stormwater program. So we've made those adjustments, um, but I think our delivery of programmatic items and projects uh, have, has continued to move forward in a, in a positive direction. Um, and we'll, we'll look forward to uh, a better uh, funding ahead in, in 2021. We are uh, in the midst of a rate study uh, for both the wastewater and stormwater um, portions of the district. So uh, there'll be more information to come about the rate study findings uh, as we move into 2021. Um, since we had not met in March as we typically do, we have had two significant events uh, occur across the service area, the March 28th, 29th event. And then again, uh, we were hit significantly uh, during the September 7th Labor Day event uh, here more recently. Um, just wanted to note that uh, our urgent storm response through our stormwater uh, inspection and maintenance group, um, which Ann Roberta will present on in more detail, uh, was a good response. Um, I think we addressed uh, many of the debris issues, all the debris issues along the regional stormwater system uh, after those events. I know there was significant flooding um, and, and Michael Blair will talk about some of those uh, components in terms of our master plan findings in terms of some of that flooding. Um, but all in all, I think the response uh, during those urgent storms uh, was good. And that just leads me to my third point in terms of the communication with the member communities um, and our uh, partners. It remains, uh, in, in my perspective, to be uh, very high. So I appreciate everyone's uh, responsiveness to, to district needs and to continued 
good coordination and communication, even at, uh, amongst this uh, different uh, playing field conditions uh, of COVID-19, we're still able to move projects and priorities forward to solve uh, some of these regional problems that have plagued us for some time. So um, with that, um, I'll turn it back over to Jeff. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. And uh, I want to provide an update for everyone on community cost share that stands now uh, in 2020. So uh, we have a community cost share funds balance of over $29.7 million. Uh, we have 82 projects with executed agreements at a total of 8.4 million. 31 projects with agreements in progress, totaling over 3.4. And then the community cost share funds that are available to member communities that still haven't been accounted for is $7.8 million. Uh, we have 21 approved allocations agreements for 9.8. And uh, good news is that of our 55 member communities all have participated in some way uh, with a project from community cost share. So, you know, we still have those funds out there that we're looking for uh, our member communities to use. I'm more than happy to uh, speak with you uh, with about your community cost share and, and I'm always looking to help people spend their money. So uh, look for me if you need uh, some ideas on how to use those funds as well. Just a reminder that uh, in order to move forward with your project after you've submitted the application, we need to have an official approved application and an executed agreement before we move forward with that project. That's that uh, pre-approval um, that is required. And also just keep in mind, many of our communities as is shown here um, have used the allocation agreements. And if you're not familiar with those, um, that's just a way for our member communities to get moving on larger projects uh, before the funds are actually in their account. So you can get that pre-approval um, and then allow the funds to build up um, over the next five years. So um, that's a good way to get moving on something instead of waiting for those funds to accrue. And uh, last but not least, if you have a, a completed your project, we want to get the uh, reimbursement forms submitted. Uh, we want to get that money back to our member community. So if you have completed projects out there that you have not submitted uh, that reimbursement request, please get those into us. We want to get that money out. So a quick update on where we stand uh, with the LSSESs or the Local Sewer System Evaluation Studies. Uh, most of uh, our communities here reside within the Heights Hilltop Interceptor. And that study has been completed and those community reports have been sent out. Uh, in the Mill Creek Interceptor uh, area, we are drafting those final reports. Those will be sent out to our member communities. And in the combined sewer area, uh, we have the community review of analysis going on right now. The Cuyahoga Valley Interceptor, or CVI, uh, those reports and final hydraulic analysis are being drafted right now. And in the Southwest Interceptor, we're on phase two of the problem identification and solution development. So most of you, uh, like I said, are in that HHI Heights Hilltop uh, Interceptor. And uh, so that LSSES is complete and you should have those reports. If you have any questions, about those reports, uh, need some verification or anything, please feel free to reach out to me on that. MCIP funding, uh, moving forward. So as Matt uh, touched on, the sewer district is facing declining revenue in 2020 due to the COVID crisis. Um, unfortunately, that took the 2021 MCI funding down to $2.5 million, but still with that, um, we were able to award seven projects. We had three with the traditional design and construction and four with the new design only.
Those projects consist of the, the three with the design and construction. Those were awarded to South Euclid, Maple Heights, and the Lorain County Commissioners. And on the design only side of things, we had East Cleveland, Shaker Heights, and two projects in Parma that were awarded funding. Matt also mentioned the fact that we are moving forward on a rate study that will be occurring in 2021. We anticipate uh, funding, another round of funding for MCIP. And with that, we are hoping to have design and construction dollars as well as design only. So we are hoping to keep MCIP moving forward. And again, I uh, hope you have all seen this map before, but uh, this identifies the communities and who your watershed team leader is. As someone who is colorblind, I will not uh, tell you what colors they are, but uh, I represent the, uh, the Lake Erie direct tributaries and Chagrin River, along with Cleveland, uh, Myring's out in Olmstead Township area, Rocky River, and then also in the Cuyahoga South. And Donna has Parma, Seven Hills, and those communities uh, south of Cleveland. Keith McClintock is monitoring if we have any questions, and I should have mentioned that before, but uh, if you have any questions, please type them into the comments and uh, Keith will notify me uh, if we have any. Keith, have we gotten any yet? Uh, we do not have any questions. Okay. Well, feel free to uh, you know, type in any questions or comments that you might have throughout the presentation and we'll be touching in with Keith and, and we'll, uh, we'll address those. Uh, so next up, we have special features from uh, Lila Zotner, who's our project manager of property acquisition. She's gonna be talking about acquisition, demolition and property owner communications. And then followed up with Paul Kowalczyk, who is our stormwater specialist talking about partner grant support request process. So let me hand it over to Lila Zotner. Lila. Hello, Jeff. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. As Jeff said, my name is Lila Zotner. Um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about property acquisition for the stormwater management program. Uh, as Jeff said, my title is property manager for property acquisition. I'll let you read the uh, items along the left on the slide. Um, mostly what I wanna to talk to you about is our process for acquisition, which we did cover last year, but I wanted to review it with everyone. Uh, when we do, do, do land assembly in project areas, we follow a general process. Our process begins with outreach. That outreach is generally a conversation with the community, with you, uh, so that you understand our project, understand our assembly goals, we both understand each other's expectations in terms of maintenance and demolition and so on. After that, we assign a consultant. Currently, we work with three consultants. We work with West Creek, Land Conservancy, Western Reserve, and OR Colon. Those organizations uh, are our on the ground representation. They are out knocking on doors, having the, the uh, talks with different homeowners, generally alongside with us. Um, once we've had the conversations with homeowners and a homeowner is generally supportive of moving forward through the process, they're fully turned over to the consultant. At that point, they will the acquisition will go through an appraisal. Uh, this stands for easements as well as for fee simple acquisitions. The appraisal is then reviewed and that a fair market offer is created. If the homeowner chooses to accept the fair market offer, we then do uh, a board resolution. It does have to be approved by our board of directors, and then it will go into a fairly traditional closing. After that, if folks aren't ready to leave their home, if they need time to relocate, we do offer leases. The leases are generally up to six months and are no cost. However, they are expected to pay the utility uh, utilities and maintain the property during that time. Once they move out, our consultant does a move out inspection and secures the property. They then do uh, periodic inspections about every three weeks where they're going inside of the property as well as checking out the exterior of the property. Finally, the property will be demolished. Currently, we work with the Cuyahoga Land Bank on all of our demolitions. The Land Bank is the organization that will work with the communities to seek the permits, do the inspections and so forth. After the property is demolished, we will either do a small water resource project at that time, 
or we'll continue assembling um, with a, a greater project in mind. To date, we've had great success. We've purchased 41 fee simple properties and we've purchased 86 permanent easements for a total investment of $8.5 million. Next slide, please, John. Thank you. I was asked to highlight one of our larger land assembly efforts. This is the Hemlock Creek Bank Stabilization Project in Seven Hills. This project se seeks to realign a portion of Hemlock Creek to increase conveyance, increase storage, and decrease erosion. The area went through a conceptual design in 2000, beginning in 2018, and land assembly began in 2019. To date, we've, we've purchased nine of the 12 privately owned residences that we would like to purchase. Six of those have been demolished and the rest will be demolished once the tenants or former homeowners move out. Looking at the map, you can see the properties that we've purchased are in red. Uh, the blue property is a very recent purchase. The purple properties are our property interests or properties that we seek to purchase in the future. And the green are uh, properties that we expect that we will have to um, purchase easements on in order to do the project. Throughout this process, we've worked very closely with the cities. It's been mutually beneficial. Uh, one example of that is that we've been able to make these vacant properties available for communities for training. So we've had fire departments as well as SWAT teams um, do the training in the properties. And that generally happens right before demolition. If we do own properties, properties in your area and you would like to, to use them for training, we do encourage you to reach out uh, and work with us on that. Now that we have completed phase one of the land assembly, we're going to be uh, starting or planning to restart the design for phase one while we continue on phase two of land assembly in the future. To date, we have, uh, have a total investment of $2.4 million in property. Uh, when we are when we are finished, we expect that number to be around three point one million dollars. Thank you. Uh, now I'll go ahead and um, introduce uh, Paul. Thank you. Thanks, Lila. Good afternoon, everyone. So in the past, the district has used stormwater funds to help leverage state and federal grant money for projects that benefit the regional stormwater system. Specifically, we've made it a practice to provide match funding for grants. This includes, but isn't limited to, 319 funding, Sustain Our Great Lakes funding, Clean Ohio funding, Coastal Management Assistant grants, and the like. And for 2021 and beyond, we've made a decision to just try and formalize the process for distributing those matching funds uh, to help you out with any grant project you're working on. In 2021, we've designated 500,000 in matching stormwater funds available for grant funded projects. And if you are requesting funding from us, we'd like to see it under $300,000 for of a request for an individual project. What we'd like to receive from you as sort of an application is a good project summary with anticipated outcomes a cost estimate with line items and unit costs, plus the total cost, a simple concept graphic showing the work area and the proposed work that you would like to do, and of course, the dollar amount you're requesting from the district. If there is a nine element plan for non-source point implementation uh, made created for that watershed, you can use the um, project summary sheet as a template for your submittal to us. Um, but we'd like to see a little bit more detail in the project description uh, so we could re-evaluate it. Next slide, please. Submitted to me by the end of this year. And our plan is to review these and let you know about potential funding by mid-February of 2021. Next slide. What we'll do is we will uh, nominate each application to our stormwater construction plan and rank them against each other. We would not be competing against other potential projects in our construction plan. Funding will be distributed according to rank 
and we can be available to assist with developing your concept or your proposed project if you'd like. We can also provide in-kind services if, if district funds are not awarded to you. And projects must include design and construction that result in improvements to the regional stormwater system. And specifically, I'll mention that this is for leveraging outside funding and should not be designated um, to fund a project outright. So uh, if, are there any questions, Keith? Paul, I do not see any questions uh, as of yet. Okay, if you have any future questions, feel free to reach out to Lila uh, as far as property acquisition and myself regarding leveraging grant funding for your project. And I think I can turn it over to Mike Blair, who's going to talk about the stormwater master plan. Thanks everyone. Thanks a lot, Paul, and, and good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak with you today about the Chagrin River and Lake Erie Direct Tributary Stormwater Master Plan. Uh, first of all, what I'd like to do is give you a kind of a status of where we are with the overall uh, stormwater master plan study throughout our service area. Uh, in spite of COVID-19, uh, we've actually made uh, quite a bit of headway with uh, all the uh, master plans uh, up, up to this point. Uh, we've actually uh, completed uh, two of the master plans. Uh, essentially, we've done everything for the Cuyahoga River uh, subwatershed. We have also essentially completed the uh, master plan itself uh, for the Rocky River subwatershed as well. We're just uh, doing some minor uh, additional work uh, with some available funds that we had uh, to basically provide some additional services uh, for that study area. And finally, which, which will be more important to the, uh, to the attendees of today's WAC meeting, um, is with the Chagrin River Lake Erie Direct Trips Master Plan. At this time, we're uh, about 67% complete, and we're still looking at a completion date of May of 2021. Uh, to provide you a little, little bit more of, uh, of detail where we are with this master plan, um, as of uh, this month, we've completed uh, over 92% of the field data collection work. Um, we did have some minor impacts um, involving the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and uh, in spite of that, our field crews were actually able to uh, um, follow the pandemic protocols of uh, spacing and masks and, and other protocols to uh, uh, complete much of the remaining field work. And what we're uh, gonna be tying up uh, in this uh, fall period is completing the spherical imagery uh, in our subwatershed and also completing the culverted stream inspections and getting those PAC reports uh, put together that we can use for the rest of the study. In addition to that, uh, we are well underway with the uh, model development uh, for each of the uh, uh, subwatersheds within the study area. So to provide you a little bit more information about that, um, at this time, we've uh, currently completed the, uh, uh, the swim models uh, for the Dome Brook subwatershed and for Beecher's Brook uh, within the uh, Chagrin River uh, watershed itself. Uh, and then we are also currently well underway with the models for both Euclid Creek, Pepper Loose Creek, Nine Mile Creek, Dugway, and Wiley Creek. And again, I'd like to reiterate to everybody is that as we finish these uh, uh, models, this is one of the items that will be available to, uh, to various communities and to uh, other stakeholders um, if you're looking to, uh, or if you need this uh, information uh, to do any follow-up project or design work um, in your uh, individual communities. We are also uh, starting to really get into uh, taking this uh, information that we've collected during our field work and the models and start to identify the problem areas within the various watersheds and also starting to develop the alternative evaluations and the preferred recommendations uh, for the uh, problems that are identified. Uh, we've currently identified the uh, problem areas and are close to finishing the preferred alternatives in Beecher's Brook. Uh, we've made some major uh, headway on the uh, Dome Brook subwatershed itself, uh, not only with uh, Dome Brook, but also looking at uh, uh, the Shaker Lakes themselves. And then we're also uh, starting to identi uh, identify those problem areas 
both within the Euclid Creek and the Pepper Loose Creek subwatersheds. And um, overall with this, I wanna just kind of reiterate to everybody that um, we really do appreciate the, the coordination um, and help that we've been getting for our member communities, either when we've been reaching out to uh, uh, individual members trying to get uh, drawings or other information uh, to help us um, with the, uh, support the modeling efforts that we're looking to do, um, getting information about uh, uh, flood stage and such, all that information is being wrapped into the study area. Uh, so we really appreciate your help with that. As I mentioned, as we develop these problem areas and start getting close to um, identifying alternatives and preferred alternative, we will be uh, trying to schedule uh, meetings either virtually or in person, depending on how things go with the COVID uh, pandemic. I'll be uh, working with uh, Jeff to uh, schedule these meetings with each of the communities to basically present these uh, problem, uh, problem identification areas to you, basically getting some um, uh, coordination and, and confirmation from yourselves as well as to what we're seeing with, uh, with our data. And then we can talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing as far as the uh, alternative evaluation. Um, again, we're looking at uh, completing the stormwater master plan and getting the community reports out to the individual communities um, around the third quarter of 2021. And uh, with that, um, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them at this time, or if you wanna leave them on the chat box, I'll respond to that um, afterwards. And uh, with that, I will hand it over to Amber Burrow, who will go over our, our swim work. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Mike. I'm Anna Bruto. I'm a stormwater inspector, stormwater inspection and maintenance department. And I'm going to cover three areas today, our inspection and maintenance program, our culverted stream inspections, and the Labor Day storm event. So moving into our 2020 inspection program, um, Lake Erie tributary watersheds. So far to date, we've completed 185 inspections, which are marked by the yellow dots. And we have also received 27 responsible party benchmark inspections in the Lake Erie tributary watersheds marked by the green dots. And other responsible parties include the Ohio Department of Transportation, the county, the Cleveland Metro Parks, railroads, turnpike owned, and other inspected crossings. In the Chagrin River watershed, uh, we have completed 78 inspections to date. And there have been 23 responsible party benchmark inspections. This is an example of a customer service request that we received out in Pepper Pike um, along Pepper Loose Creek. A large tree fell and it was impacting stream conveyance. So we went out and inspected it and wrote it up for maintenance. And it was a total of 75 cubic yards of debris removed. Moving into the 2020 maintenance program, this is a photo of debris. Oh. Sorry, this is a photo of debris um, just upstream of a culvert inlet in Forest Hills in East Cleveland along Hugway East. Um, so far to date, uh, we have completed 36 sediment and debris projects marked by the yellow dots. We've removed 878 cubic yards of debris and 70 cubic yards of sediment in the Lake Erie tributary watersheds. We have also completed six other projects, which are marked by the red dots that include three stream bank stabilization projects that were completed, um, two in Richmond Heights and one in Highland Heights, a head wall repair, tree removal, and a boom installation at Horseshoe Dam and Shaker Heights. In the Chagrin River watershed, we completed 10 sediment and debris projects, removing 225 cubic yards of debris and 120 cubic yards of sediment. And we completed one other stream bank stabilization project in Pepper Pike to address a scour, scour issue at a culvert outlet. So just to compare our 2020 versus 2019 maintenance, uh, we had more projects in 2020, but we removed slightly less debris and sediment. 
Uh, here's an example of maintenance performed at Bumba Dam in uh, Cleveland along Doan Brook. We removed 40 cubic yards of debris, and that was taken um, March 30th after the March storm event. And here's another example. Um, this was it, following the July 11th storm event. Uh, this debris was located just north of Lake Sharp, Lakeshore Boulevard um, along Nine Mile Creek in Brannell, and we removed 35 cubic yards of debris. So here's an example of one of our small scale maintenance projects. This was completed along Euclid Creek East and Richmond Heights. Um, we removed failing man made bank protection in the form of stacked concrete and failed gabions and replaced it with boulder riprap, live stakes, and native plantings along the top of the bank. Um, this is a more recent example of a completed stream bank stabilization project in Mayfield Heights along a tributary to the Chagrin River. Um, due to the angle and proximity of the right bank erosion next to the residence condo, we took a hard armoring approach and we installed stack rock, a stack rock wall and live branch layering with native plants above it. We also graded back uh, left bank to a gentle slope and plantings are going to be installed at the end of this month. Moving on to our culverted stream inspections. Uh, these have been a major focus for us in SWIM this year because, of, because all of the stormwater master planning data is now becoming available in the form of PACP reports and CCTV footage. So our process in SWIM is that we review the stormwater master planning PACP reports and the CCTV footage, and we review and prioritize our follow-up inspections based on their condition. We'll schedule SWIM entries or follow-up CCTV inspections um, to inspect them for potential future maintenance. Um, because the Chagrin Lake Erie tributary data is uh, so new, we have not yet begun to inspect the culverted streams and are planning on making that a 2021 activity. So just to give you an example of a culverted stream inspection, this is along Mill Creek in Garfield Heights and the corrugated metal pipe, the invert, uh, was completely deteriorated. So you can see the holes there and water was infiltrating underneath the culvert. Um, the stormwater master planning recommendation was rehabilitation or replacement. And uh, another example in Mill Creek, uh, the invert wasn't as bad in this culvert, but you can see the loss of galvanizing and sections of heavy rust, especially underneath the local tying points. So moving into our Labor Day storm event response, um, this is just a photo of some flooding. So the September 7th rain event was felt throughout the service area and depending on where you were located, you could have received anywhere from eight tenths of an inch upwards to five inches of total rainfall over a seven hour period. I'm going to focus on the first and last bullets. Um, so the first bullet point shows eight tenths of an inch to four and a half inches of rainfall over a peak seven hour period, which equates to the six hour recurrence interval, uh, less than one year to less than 200 year storm event, which averages out to a 25 year storm event. And the last bullet shows three tenths of an inch to eight tenths of an inch of rainfall over a peak 15 minute period which re reflects the 15 minute recurrence interval, a less than one year to less than five year storm event. And the main takeaway of this is that because of the lower intensity in the 15 minute recurrence interval, there was actually less flooding in the local system because the cash basins were able to keep up with the rain intensity. But it wasn't until the larger six hour interval that the heavy rainfall made its way to lower watersheds, contributing to elevated flows and flooding in the regional system. Um, so this is uh, the USGS stream gauge data for the September 7th rain event at Jennings Road along Big Creek in Cleveland. It was the only stream to reach the major flood stage and it peaked at 13.82 feet which is the fourth highest uh, storm event recorded. The September, May, and March storm events were all in the top 10 on record. 
And just to put it into perspective, the Cleveland Zoo floods at 12 feet. And we were able to confirm that the zoo flooded with our own inspection and media reports. And this is just some, um, these are just some photos of our field response during the Labor Day storm event. Um, so in summary, the inspection staff completed 90 observation inspections. Our maintenance staff responded to 29 maintenance work orders. Um, we removed 812 cubic yards of debris, totaling $86,000 and SWIM received upwards from 18 customer service calls. Comparing the March 30th to the September 7th storm event, we inspected, um, we did more inspections during this, following the September 7th event versus the March 30th, but we removed slightly less um, debris and performed slightly less maintenance projects. Um, can you please? Oh, thank you. Um, and this is just because the March 30th event was the first big storm event that mobilized debris and flushed the system after winter. And now I'll hand it off to Kevin Preece. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Kevin Fries. I'm the Office of Emergency Management's uh, Planning, Training, and Outreach Manager. And uh, I'm looking forward to speaking with you today. Next slide, please. So an overview, uh, we're gonna talk about an overview of our office, um, why we are uh, trying to get out to different groups and encourage preparedness, what specifically this group uh, can assist us with, and then uh, some more information about the county. Next slide, please. So the perception versus the reality of emergency management. You know, the perception is that our team only comes in during major disasters like hurricanes or tornadoes, et cetera. However, the, our local emergency management agencies work to mitigate areas of concern within our jurisdiction uh, through Homeland Security grant funded projects, uh, local emergency planning commission uh, funded projects, which is our uh, hazardous materials uh, coordination group. Uh, and work on plans and, and procedures for uh, regional response. Next slide, please. So what is emergency management? Emergency management is the process of preparing for, mitigating, responding to, and recovering from emergencies or disasters. You know, the key to all of these phases of emergency management is coordination. A lot of our efforts surround identifying additional partners that we haven't worked with uh, in the past that could benefit from our assistance in developing disaster plans or could assist during a disaster in that response. And that's kind of how we ended up uh, getting in touch and on, onto these meeting agendas uh, was through conversations with the sewer district about what this group is and uh, what people are part of these groups. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Yep. So uh, what are some things about Cuyahoga County. It's approximately 1.2 million people uh, in 59 municipalities covered by more than 60 police departments, 51 fire departments, 28 uh, public safety answering points, uh, that's up from 25, uh, 31 school districts, 19 hospitals, uh, more than 35 non-governmental organizations like Red Cross, uh, and uh, 34 specialty teams, which include their hazardous materials, uh, bombs, uh, team, SWAT team, uh, urban search and rescue, et cetera, 14 utility companies, and eight colleges or universities. Next slide, please. We're also home to a lot of major companies' international headquarters, uh, and thus we also have a number of airports, including Hopkins, Burke, and the county airport. Uh, we also have three top tier hospital systems. And we have a number of federal installations, most notably uh, the NASA Glenn Research Center over on the west side of the county. Next slide, please. To support all of those people and those companies, we have billions of dollars of, in infrastructure. Um, uh, and we have a lot of uh, rail operations that move through the county, mostly freight, however, some passenger as well uh, with track moving through the area. 
the Port of Cleveland is uh, one of the larger ports on the um, Great Lakes. And we also ha are a major transportation hub for the Midwest um, with seven interstate highways, five US routes, over 1200 bridges, and then 4,300 miles of municipal roads in the county. Next slide, please. So our office is responsible for doing uh, threat hazard identification and risk analysis. Uh, so what are some of the hazards that we could potentially experience or have experienced here in Cuyahoga County? As you can see from these pictures, we've had everything from freezing rain, blizzards, tornadoes, earthquakes, massive power outages, the effects of uh, hurricanes, uh, major flooding from our normal weather patterns, and you know even the river caught on fire. So. Uh, we've also seen a number of organizations in the county become the subject of IT systems, uh, failures, or hacks. Next slide, please. However, uh, as you can see on this, most of our presidentially declared disasters have been flooding related. Um, the most recent presidential, uh, presidentially declared disaster was uh, destructive winds in 2013, but prior to that, a lot of flooding. Next slide, please. So, as you can see, the lighthouse has been since thawed, and the Cuyahoga River has become a lot more, uh, a lot cleaner, thanks to the efforts of multiple partners. Um, we still have a need for um, planning uh, and continually engaging with our partners to ensure that we are preparing and that our partners are prepared. Next slide, please. So what we do is work with our partners um, to enhance our preparedness planning and, and really making sure we have an effective response to any disasters or emergencies that might happen. And that's why I'm here today, uh, because during our conversations, like I said, with the sewer district, we were told about these meetings, that it was a group that we don't generally interact with. Uh, we wanted to make sure you were aware of what our role is related to damage and especially related to flooding. Um, and then when disasters or incidents cause damage, uh, it's our job to collect information uh, as much as possible uh, so that we can determine if the county would be eligible for a disaster declaration. If we are eligible for a disaster declaration, um, there are two main funding streams that can open up. Uh, individual assistance is for residents uh, who have been impacted um, by a particular incident. Um, and then public assistance is for governments and certain nonprofit uh, response partners uh, to recuperate some of the expenses that they've incurred in responding to and recovering from that disaster. Thus, uh, during flooding or after a tornado, uh, we really need to be made aware of the areas that have been affected. And then if we can also get you know, the number of structures that are destroyed, suffered major damage, minor damage, uh, and then simply were affected, um, we can then compile that information and submit it to the state. We also need to know what uh, the municipal governments and response partners spent. Uh, and there's a certain spreadsheet that we share with those uh, communities. Um, once we get all of that information, we compile it. We look to see if we think we will meet the threshold. Uh, and if we think we will, we then package that up and send it to the state for their review. And ultimately, uh, hopefully, their submission to the federal government. Next slide, please. So what is our organizational structure? Uh, we're split into two divisions, uh, operations and planning. Our operations um, uh, department division is responsible for maintaining our emergency operations center uh, in a fully ready state. Um, they also coordinate damage assessment teams, uh, support our local emergency planning commission uh, and they also work on designing exercises, uh, tabletop exercises, and providing uh, general administrative support to the office. 
The planning section, uh, on the other hand, maintains over 100 different uh, plans uh, related to coordinate, uh, coordination and response. Uh, we also coordinate training sessions for our partners uh, on emergency planning and response. Um, we have staff members that will go to outreach events, you know, home days, et cetera, to share information with residents about um, how to prepare and the different threats that we face here in Cuyahoga County. Uh, and then we also maintain our website and social media accounts and provide technical assistance and guidance to our community partners and agencies on planning and, and developing their own plans. A few of those plans that are of significant importance uh, or of significance to this group uh, are the All Hazards Mitigation Plan, which is available on our website, and then the FIRA, or Threat Hazards Identification and Risk Assessment, and the Stakeholder Preparedness Report. The All Hazards Mitigation uh, Plan is important for this group to be aware of because it makes us eligible for a number of non-disaster related uh, funding streams and grants, okay. including the BRIC, the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant Program, uh, the Flood Mitigation Assistance Program, and the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. Uh, this plan does require stakeholder input and needs to be accepted uh, by every community and agency that is interested in applying for grant funds to complete uh, those types of mitigation products, uh, projects. We'll be starting an update to that plan in 2021 uh, as it has to be updated and signed off and accepted every five years. The FIRA and SPR enable us to apply for other public safety related grants through the Department of Homeland Security. And completion of those plans also requires stakeholder input, which we usually, usually obtain through uh, the various committees of the Cuyahoga County Emergency Services Advisory Board. One of those committees is actually a public works committee. Um, that committee has been less active in recent years, and we're trying to reinvigorate it. Uh, so if any of you are interested or know of anyone interested, uh, please let us our, let our office know so that we can get you on that committee and, and uh, start working with everyone on uh, incorporating uh, public works and uh, service agencies into uh, our planning efforts. Next slide, please. So during disasters, uh, we all work uh, together uh, within the National Incident Management System or the incident command system. So as local communities run out of resources during, and that can be uh, stuff or people um, during an incident, uh, they normally reach out via mutual aid to surrounding communities for assistance. Once that is exhausted, those communities or partner agencies reach out to our office uh, for assistance. And we uh, then search for the needed resources within our county. Um, if we can't find them in the county, we reach out to neighboring counties as well as the state um, for assistance. The state, if they don't have it, uh, they can then reach out to the federal government and other states if the resource uh, isn't available within the state. We've done this in the past for the Arco landfill fire, which required a multi-day multi response, um, as well as large events like the presidential debate uh, that happened most recently um, with a number of teams coming in from outside the area. Next slide, please. With that, uh, I will ask if there are any questions. Um, and please feel free to reach out to our office anytime for additional information or coordination. Thank you, Kevin. I do not Thank see you. any questions at this time. Okay, hey, thank you, Kevin. I'm Jana Popielski. I'm the stormwater program manager with the district. And I'd like to start off first by talking about the stormwater design and construction program and how we prioritize the projects that we're going to be doing. With all of the information that we've been getting from the stormwater master plans, we've taken the opportunity to start to look at how we're prioritizing projects in a different way. And this is by looking at the number of problems in an area and the level of service that that area has. So we've divided this into four quadrants and for the lower priority projects in the lower left-hand side, this would be a lower number of 
problems with a high level of service. So in this quadrant, you would have a problem area or a project such as a roadway that floods, one section of roadway that floods at say the 50 or 100 year level of service. Moving to the next quadrant, you would have a low number and a low level of service. So this would be something such as a house that might flood um, at say the five year event, but it's just one house. In this particular instance, we would look for ways to solve the problem rather quickly. Maybe we could purchase the one house and get those people out of harm's way. But we would look for a way to try and resolve the project as soon as possible. Sometimes that's not always possible, but we always look for opportunities. In the next quadrant, we have a high number of problems and a high level of service. And this is fairly common. Um, this would be an area where you have a number of homes and roadways that would flood or being threatened at say the 50 to 100 year event again. And then the highest priority project areas are the high number of problems with the low level of service. So these are areas that experience frequent flooding or a lot of erosion. Um, some of them have hundreds of assets, hundreds of homes, hundreds of roadway sections that are being impacted. A lot of these problem areas are rather large and therefore the cost to solve these problems are rather expensive. And so we're looking at ways to phase or to do portions of the project that might have the greatest benefit. And I'll give an example of that as we move into the presentation. So I just wanna remind everybody that we do have our stormwater story map under the doing business with us section. And if you go to that, you'll see that we break out our projects in design, construction, and complete so that you can see what we have in the works, what's gonna be coming up, and what we've already done. We've added to the complete section our 319 projects because as Paul mentioned, we are helping with matching funding for 319. And we've also added in the small scale design projects, design construction projects that Anne highlighted during her portion. So you can see all of those in there. We don't put those under the design or construction tabs because they are they do tend to be rather fast moving and by the time we update them, a lot of times they're already complete. Then moving into some of the design projects, I'm going to take the opportunity first to highlight a project that was completed that we just we just want to make sure that we tell everybody about it because we consider it to be a great success. And this is Stickney Creek in the city of Brooklyn, right upstream of Ridge Road. There was a um, combined sewer, uh, intercommunity sewer that was exposed within Stickney Creek, 60 inch brick sewer. And it was leaking into the creek and the creek was leaking into the sewer. We couldn't allow that situation to continue, but we wanted to address it in a manner that not just, um, not just dealt with the sewer, but also benefited the regional system. So the approach that we took was to move the sanitary sewer, to move the combined sewer out of the creek, move it further off to what would be the left in the picture. And then since we moved it further, we had the opportunity to expand this floodplain. And as you can see, this is the August 28th event, which was not one of the larger events that we've had this year. But you can see how much it's just utilized, the stream has just utilized the new floodplain that it's been given. Next picture. And this is just a few hours after that picture was taken. The first one was taken by a resident who lives nearby who said that in events like that in the past, Ridge Road would have definitely overtopped. But in this case, the floodplain acted just as it should. It held back the water and then it slowly drained out. And you can see the nice stream that reemerged after the water receded. So we just like to highlight this project. The residents have been very happy with it. We're very pleased with it and we're gonna to continue to watch to see how it develops. Some of the other projects that we do have currently in design and actually are moving into construction um, are on Pepper Creek. So this is Pepper Loose Creek at Lander Road in Pepper Pike. There was an actively eroding stream um, that was starting to cut into a sanitary system, a septic system. Failing gabion baskets were all along the stream bank as well. And so we're gonna be going in here to um, stabilize the stream, create new floodplain, expand the floodplain that already exists. And this project has already been bid out and it is moving into construction. Next slide. 
In the city of North Royalton, we have the Ridge Road, um, Ridge Road Repair and Rocky River Tributary Stabilization Project. And I'm sure a lot, this will look familiar to a lot of you because I know that there are similar situations along a lot of the roadways in Northeast Ohio where the stream has eroded right up to the roadway embankment. And you can see in the picture, especially the bottom one, it might be a little bit hard, but the posts for the guardrail are actually hanging off at this point. And the roadway, the asphalt is starting to fall in. So instead of taking the hard approach of driving sheet pile along the roadway, we've decided to take a different approach with this particular project. It was awarded just um, in, on October 15th and construction will be starting up. Next slide. And what we've decided to do is as opposed to hardening that embankment, we're actually going to be moving the stream away. So you can see the before picture at the bottom of where the stream is running directly parallel to Ridge Road. So we'll be moving it away, giving it a new alignment, expanding the floodplain and dealing with the root cause of the problem. We're able to do this because we can work with private property owners. A lot of times the municipalities or ODOT are restricted to working within the existing right of way. But we have the ability to work with the neighboring property owners to get easements to do these projects in this manner. The Chippewa Creek near Broadview Road is another situation where we have a stream that's eroding into a local sanitary sewer. It's also threatening a very large uh, gabion wall that's holding up an apartment complex parking garage. And so we're going to be moving the stream away from the gabion wall because it is starting to undercut it and also protect the sanitary sewer at the same time. When we're working on these projects, we do tend to run into some pretty interesting situations. And in this particular case, we've run into an abandoned um, wastewater treatment plant that has a fairly large metal tank right adjacent to the stream. And so we work through these problems to figure out what's the best approach. And that's what we're in the process of doing right now. We are in the final stages of design and we'll be moving into construction for this one next year. And then the final project in the design stage that I'd like to highlight is the Big Creek Upper Ridgewood Basin modifications. As I mentioned when I talked about the project prioritization, sometimes these project areas are so large that we need to start to split them up and do smaller pieces of them. And this is one example. The master plan recommendation identified this project as being over $20 million total because it's, so, it's such a large area. But obviously we can't afford to do all $20 million at once, but we did see an opportunity where there was a city owned basin within the project area that the city of Parma is willing to allow us to retrofit and expand to provide additional storage and reduce the downstream flooding. So this project has just kicked off in the design phase, or sorry, it will be starting design phase here very shortly, and then we'll plan on constructing it in 2022. We do like projects, some, we, or we do try to find projects that, um, you know, if they're city owned property, something that we can move forward with a little bit sooner, um, that is advantageous to us, uh, because it does take a lot of time, of course, to negotiate the easements with the property owners. So this was a good opportunity, and we're glad to move this one forward. And into some of the construction projects, um, again, in the city of Parma, this one's along West Creek, and this is a bank stabilization. West Creek was eroding into the parking lot and the ambulance entrance for a nursing home. The creek is constrained on both sides by commercial properties. And as you've seen in a lot of our projects, we do look for opportunities to expand the floodplain, give the creek some more space, but of course, that's not always the case. And this is one example where it absolutely wasn't. We just didn't have anywhere to um, move the creek to. So we have gone about constructing a soldier pile wall. Um, this is Neroni was uh, awarded this contract and they're in the final stages of it now. Um, in addition to the soldier pile wall, there is riprap um, at the toe as well because of the height of the wall and the extensive amount of erosion that this site was, in, was experiencing. And then the final construction project that I'll highlight is the Dome Brook Culvert Debris Removal. And this is along Dome Brook, the culvert, the stream is actually culverted as it goes through University Circle. 
in the center of that map, that's the lagoon right behind the art museum. It goes past there. In some of the recent flooding events, um, when University Circle flooded, we did some inspections of that culvert and we found two debris blockages that were reducing the capacity inside that culvert. But we didn't understand at that time how much they were reducing the capacity. We had a project going on down, directly downstream of the culvert, which was close to the one blockage. And so we did go forward and remove that under the previous contract a few years ago. But we left the one that was further upstream because it's 1500 lineal feet into the culvert. So it's a tight space. It's going to take a lot of work to remove it. Through the master plan and the modeling efforts that that team did, we came to realize that it was significantly reducing the capacity of that culvert from a two year down to a 10, or for, I'm sorry, from a 10 year down to a two year level of service. So that's when we decided that we needed to go in there and get the debris out. So we have awarded a contract in order to do that. We'll be removing 700 cubic yards of mostly cobble, broken up um, brick. Next slide. And you can see in this picture here what it looks like. So this will be a fairly long drawn out process to get all that material out of there because it is a tight working space and there's quite a bit of it. But it's a good opportunity to really increase the level of service without doing a major construction project. And with that, are there any questions, Keith? I do not see any. Okay, well, thank you. I believe I'll be turning it back over to Jeff. All right, big thank you to all of our presenters uh, this afternoon, great job. Uh, so a couple of things uh, before we leave you, um, I just want to remind everyone of our cost savings programs and you know during these challenging times, this is uh, available to our customers, uh, the crisis assistance program um, is available for qualifying wastewater accounts that are over uh, $500 um, in their delinquency in over 180 days so they can qualify up to a one time. Uh, $300 credit, so that is available to them. And then on stormwater accounts, uh, there is no minimum account balance, but uh, that 180 day delinquency um, is required. So there is some assistance out there to, uh, to help our customers. Um, this is available once per year, and uh, it's you need to have a qualifying uh, life changing uh, hardship, if you will, loss of job, loss of income, death in the family, or medical expenses. So just wanted to remind folks that that is out there, and this is run by the Cle Cleveland Housing Network on our behalf. So. Additionally, we have the, uh, the Homestead and the Affordability Program. Homestead is available to uh, folks over 65 and or permanently disabled with the household income um, less than $33,500 and the affordability program, uh, that's for anybody with an annual income um, at or below 200% of the poverty level. So again, there is relief out there for our customers um, if they are having hardships and dealing with their, their uh, wastewater or stormwater bills. Uh, we encourage them to call our customer service at 216 881-8247. And that's all that we have for you this afternoon. Uh, we appreciate you being here and uh, hearing about uh, the Regional Stormwater Management Program. Here is my contact information. If you need anything, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. I recommend giving me a call on my cell phone as I am working at home so it's a better access I do get voicemail message at the office, but uh, cell phone is a little bit better to reach me at. We will be posting the presentation on the uh, Stormwater Program Community Resources website if you need to refer back to any of this information. So at this time, again, I thank you and uh, everybody have a nice afternoon.